In the book of Ezekiel chapter 20, we are today studying Ezekiel, ministering the book of Ezekiel all the way through, and we're in chapter 20. And as I looked at chapter 20 and was studying it, I noticed that I was not going to be able to complete a, a uh, presentation of that a ministry, a sermon of that in one session. So I did split it up in two. Today, we're going to go through chapter 20 and comment as we go. And then next week, the Lord willing, and when we bring this up again, we're going to speak more about what the Lord is actually saying in all of this because today we're going to go through of course as recorded here the history of God speaking to his people Israel and their response to him and next week uh, we will go through uh, what he's what he's really wanting them to do he's very clear as he does this but as you know, that he speaks in in uh, parables and also uh, metaphors and things like that. But it's very plain when you become uh, knowledgeable of how God speaks and of his word. And it begins here with the history. Genesis is the history. And that's the creation. We read it as history. But it is the beginning. It is the, the very beginning of all things as we know them. And the, uh, the one that had no beginning is the author. And he is revealing his word today. Today, we see the title. It says, I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. The Lord spoke those words to Israel who is uh, very rebellious and uh, disobedient, seemingly unable to really grasp a hold of what God is saying or what he really wants from them. And so we look at the word sanctified. This is what it's all about. The Lord is really seeking for them to be separated from the world, but unto him. Come to him and be separate from the world. And to be separate from the world, you have to live separately from the world. That means you live in him. You live in this sanctified life. You live in the word of God. And that's what this is all about. So this is the biblical chuck wagon at Lighthouse Ranch. Come and dine with us. And let's believe God for us to hear and understand and to carry out God's plan in our own lives. Respond favorably. Understand what he's saying to us today, the same as he said to them. So verse 1 that it came to pass in the seventh year. The seventh year is what Ezekiel, who is the, the prophet that God is using to record this. It's the seventh year since he was carried from Jerusalem to Babylon. And he's prophesying from Babylon. And in the fifth month and the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Of course, the elders of Israel knew that Ezekiel was a prophet and they could receive a word from the Lord by asking Ezekiel to seek the Lord for them. But we're going to see a very different response from the Lord as we go through this. Verse 2 said, 
Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel and say it unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Are you come to inquire of me? Question mark. As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. In other words, I'm not even going to listen to you. Strange. But by this we begin to understand God. As we don't just take this one statement, but as we read through and find out what God is really saying besides this, the Lord has decided that he's not going to listen to these people, but he's going to say why now. He's going to say why in the, in the, in the, uh, in the verses after this, in the message after that statement. And he says to Ezekiel, wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. He's telling Ezekiel, we've got to let them know the abomination of their fathers. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, we went through and we understood by the word of God in the 17th chapter, uh, of of Ezekiel that that everyone is judged by their own actions but here the Lord wants them to know the abomination of their fathers another interesting point as we go on keep that in mind and we'll see why as we finish today and say unto them thus saith the Lord God in the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them saying, I am the Lord your God. He revealed himself to him themselves, himself, excuse me, to the people of Israel. In, that, in the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. In other words, the Lord saw this land of Israel as it was in those days, and he chose that land, a good land, a fruitful land a pleasant land, and he espied it for them. In other words, he, he saw it and, and was uh, going to give it to them. Verse 7, Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. There's the message right there. Is that I'm delivering you out of Egypt where they've got all kinds of false gods, idols that they worship. You're looking at them and it looks like you think they're, they're pretty good and you like to worship them too. He says, cast those away. I am the Lord, your God. There's no other God but me. I am the Lord, your God. Verse 8 says, but they rebelled. They rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not, every man cast away the abomination of their eyes. They wouldn't turn away from those idols. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish mine anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So he was deciding right there that he had enough of it and he was going to chastise them and bring them into judgment in Egypt. But look at verse nine. 
it's very important to understand the God and to understand this, this chapter and the message. It starts out with but. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen. He didn't want his name to be blasphemed there in the land of Egypt because of the way that he was going to correct these people. But I wrought not, I, I, but I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted for the, before the heathen, that his name wouldn't be polluted among them that were in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. Wherefore, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. So I delivered them out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Verse 11, and I gave them my statutes, showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. They brought them out into the wilderness. As you remember, they were over there at Mount Sinai and the Lord gave them the 10 commandments. He gave them the word of God. He gave them the truth and said that if you do them, you'll live by them. Now, that is not saying if you do them, then you live by them. It's saying you will live by them if you do them. If you do them, you'll live by them. If you just if you just believe in them without doing them, you really aren't living by them. He's saying you have to do them to live by them. And to do and to live is the same thing. If you do them, you will live by them. If you don't do them, you won't live by them. Verse 12, moreover also, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Notice this is all about sanctification. It, it boils down to obedience. Instead of looking out the, the specific things that the Lord is asking, it's, it's talking about being obedient to the Lord, about being yielded to the Lord. It's no different. The message is the same today. It just has different examples here. And it shows us these examples, as the word of God tells us in Corinthians, that these things that the Israelites did, it happened to them for our admonition. That all of this is actually uh, bringing us to Christ, showing us our need for Christ, showing us the, the blessing of those who follow him and the absolute demise of those who do not. Verse 13, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, they despised my judgments. How serious is that? That's saying they despised my word. They didn't like my way of life. And then he says again, which of a man do, he shall live in them. Living in them, you might make that statement, but what does it mean to live in it? It means you live in victory. It means you live freedom from the powers of darkness. It means you live with a destiny to the kingdom of God, the destiny into eternity with God. It's not just talking about the here and now, the, the, the present life that we're living in as people of all ages may read this and have for the, 
for the past several thousand years. It's the same thing. It's saying the same message to people of all ages. If you do them, you're going to live forever with God. That's what it's saying. If you don't, you won't. But if you don't do them, you wind up in judgment and torment for the rest of your existence. If they walk not in my standards and they despise not my judgments, if a man do them, he shall live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. So he's talking about polluting the Sabbath. And the Sabbath uh, is very important for us to understand because the Lord created the Sabbath on the seventh day. But actually, he called it his rest. And the Lord calls it the Sabbath here. We understand it, that it is the rest of God. And the Lord is desiring that we should keep it holy. Meaning that we are to enter into that rest. And stay holy. We are to, the the only way that you can get into that rest is be holy. As we're going to readily see in studying this. Especially next week as we go through what it really means to be sanctified. What does the Lord say about it? Who is sanctified and who isn't? So we just read up to verse 13, that he's ready to consume them. The Lord is ready to consume them because they have no heart for him or his word. But verse 14 says, but I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen. Why is that? Why doesn't he want the heathen to see that? Because he's concerned about the heathen also. He wants the heathen to understand that he is the Lord. That he is God. That there is no one besides him. He finishes verse 14 by saying, in whose sight I brought them out. He's saying the Gentiles saw that I brought you out. And now if I destroy you, they're going to say, God is not fair. Or God he can't keep them delivered or blame it all on the God. His name he's concerned about. Verse 15. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them again bring them, rather, into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. So because of that, I'm not going to consume them, but I'm just not going to take them into the land that I had prepared for them. Verse 16, because they despise my judgments. This is the reason why. They despise my judgments Walk not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbath, for their heart went after other gods. They, they, the Sabbath was an example of the kingdom. And the kingdom, in terms of time frame, the kingdom is a thousand years. Actually, it's an eternal kingdom. But the the kingdom that Christ will set up to begin that will be a thousand years in duration. And the only way that you can get into that kingdom is to 
live a holy life here on earth. And it's, it's the same thing depicted right here that the Lord wanted them to live a separated life during the week, every day, so that they could enter into the rest, the rest of the Lord, not the rest from physical exertion, but God's rest, which is eternal life with God, deliverance from everything evil. Verse 17. Nevertheless, here we go again, the long suffering of God. Nevertheless, mine eye spared them from destroying them. Neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers. Don't walk in the way of your fathers. Neither observe their judgments. Don't think the way they do. Don't see things the way they do. Nor defile yourselves with their idols. It's talking about a separated life from the way the fathers, who he has to bring judgment on because of their disobedience and despising him and his word. Now look at verse 19. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you. That's This is what the Lord is saying. He wants Israel to be a sign that they are God. He wants their obedience, I should say, to be a sign to the heathen that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. It is a sign to them that they are God's people because they will experience God. It's the same today, praise God, hallelujah. Verse 21, notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall live in them. If you do them, you won't die, is what he's saying. Not talking about physical death. This is all about spiritual uh, life in, in God. They polluted my Sabbath. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish mine anger against them in the wilderness. Look at verse 22. Nevertheless, the mercy of God. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen. See how important it is for God that his name is upheld, that his word is lived, that he is loved. And he's, he's, he's going to protect that. That's the desire of the Lord. He wants everybody to know that he's not like the world. He's separate from the world. He's holy. He's righteous. With the Lord, you get true justice. You get fairness. You get life. You get healing. You get peace. Praise the Lord. Speaking of the Gentile or the heathen, in whose sight I brought them forth. He wants the heathen to see 
that he's a God of deliverance. I lifted up, how, how is he going to be seen as a God of deliverance if the people don't follow him? That concerns him very much. Verse 23, I lifted up mine hand unto them also in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries because they had not executed my judgments but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's God, idols. Remember at the beginning he said, don't do like your fathers are doing. Verse 25, wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live. Wow, this, this, this is, this is really strange that the Lord would do such a thing. But let's let's see what he means by that. That he would give them something that isn't good. And judgment that they should not live by. We go to that famous chapter, that glorious chapter, that revealing chapter. Romans chapter 1, and you go all the way down to verse 28. And here it gives the reason why we just read of this. This is an example of what we just read. Even as they did not like to re retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Isn't that the example of what we just read? They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted false God. They didn't want to retain God's word. They despised his word. So he gave them over. It still came from God. He gave them over a reprobate mind. This is righteous judgment. This is what we deserve if we refuse God. He's our creator. He's God. A reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They can't do anything right. They're reprobate. And here's why. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, amen. Covenant breakers, they refuse. And without natural affection, that's what it turns into, implacable, unmerciful. And here's the end result of the whole thing who knowing the judgment of God, think of that. They knew what God said, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. They knew that. Not only do the same, do those evil things, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's what God gave them. That's what he means. That's what he meant. And that's what he means in this statement right here. Wherefore, I gave them also statutes that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live. They sh you shouldn't live in a reprobate mind. 
That goes without saying. And I polluted them in their own gifts, in that they caused to pass through the fire all that opened the womb. Think of that. Look at the extent or the, the, the length that people will go to in their disobedience to God. They go all the way, all the way perverted, reprobate. And here's the reason, that I might make them desolate. That's true justice. To the end that they might know that I am the Lord. How much plainer could that be? This is all for them. To get their eyes open to what God is all about. And that he's going to protect his word and his name. He's going to preserve them. His word is magnified above his name. Verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, continuing, speak unto the house of Israel and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass against me. What he's saying there, I told you, don't do the things that your fathers do, have done. Don't do that. Because they blasphemed me and trespassed against me. Verse 28, for when I brought them into the land for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to them, then they saw every high hill. They didn't see the, the, the beauty of the land as the Lord did, a land flowing with milk and honey. That high hill is where they, they chose to do all their debaucherous stuff in, in uh, burning their children uh, sacrificing their children, worshiping uh, demons, and all the thick trees, and they offered there their sacrifices, and there they presented the provocation of their offering. There also they made their sweet savor and poured out their 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 drink offering showing they worshiped and served these strange gods. Then I said unto them, verse 29, what is the high place whereunto you go? What are you doing? And the name that is called Bama unto this day. Idol worship, evil, debauchery, wickedness, witchcraft. Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, are you polluted after the manner of your fathers? And commit ye whoredom after their abominations? He's saying, I told you, don't do those things. And that's what you're doing. Verse 31, for when ye offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols. Even unto this day shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. He's not going to answer them. They can come and seek them all, him all they want, but he's not going to answer them because they don't have a heart for him. They're not going to get the right answer. They're going to get the wrong answer. They're going to wind up being slaves of a reprobate mindset. 
The message is no different today. In fact, we have less excuse than they had because when we come to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit to live within us. And we have that power of the living God operative in us and the manifestation of that power for those who walk in him as examples. Of course, the prophets in their day were the examples because the Lord didn't cause the, the obedient prophets. Uh, the Lord chose those that were obedient, I should say, to be his prophets. Verse 32, and that which cometh into your mind shall not be at all. He said, what you're going to say now will not be. Not be at all. That you say, we will be as the heathen, as the families of the countries to serve God, wood and stone. He said, no, you won't. He's talking about Israel. He's speaking to Israel. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out from the countries wherein ye are scattered and with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. It might seem kind of strange that he's saying that right here. But he's saying the disobedient may do that, but you won't do it. Those of you who will follow me won't do it. I'm going to take you out with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm, with fury poured out, uh, ruling by the, the uh, rod of iron, the word of the living God. Judgment will come, but I'm going to bring you through. So immediately he goes into the day of judgment. An example of it, a prof a prophecy of it. He says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. That's speaking of the tribulation period. And there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So we see that he's speaking about more than just judgment here. He's talking about the day of the Lord. That's the tribulation that starts with the rapture of the church. The true believers of the Lord will be raptured out. That's the beginning of the day of the Lord, and it will end in the tribulation period seven years later, but continues on into the kingdom period. The millennial reign of Christ. The day of the Lord is also called Jacob's trouble and also known as the tribulation, the tribulation period. Let's look at that in Jeremiah, chapter 30, verses seven through nine. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be delivered out of it. Here's a promise of the Lord to deliver Jacob. That means all of Jacob's children, meaning all of the tribes. 
He's going to deliver those that follow him. He's going to save those that follow him. Save those that love him. He's going to open their eyes so they can see the one that they pierced. Let's go on. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Saying, I'm going to bring you out of bondage. You're no longer going to be um, like you were in, in bondage at Babylon or scattered all over the world. I'm going to break that yoke off your neck. And you won't be at the mercy of, of the heathen anymore. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Clearly here, he's not talking about raising up King David, but this is in type. David the king it means the kingdom of David or the throne of David more uh, explicitly and Christ will rule on that throne at the time of the kingdom after the tribulation period. You see how plain this is. The Lord is, is telling exactly what he's going to do. Of course, it's revealed unto us as we seek the Lord here. So that's what he's saying there in that verse, those verses. I'll bring you into the wilderness of the people, the tribulation period, and there I will plead with you face to face. The Lord is going to reveal himself to the Jewish people there. And when they see him and recognize him as the one that they pierce with nails in his feet and in his hands and pierced his side, when they see that, even though they might not have been the ones that actually did that act, they knew that they were privy to it. And it was because of their decision that Christ was crucified. They're going to see their Messiah that they had crucified. And they're going to be very remorseful. The scripture tells us that. We'll probably get into that next week. How the Lord is going to do this very thing. And so those who... who recognize that and repent the Lord is going to save them there their the blinders are going to be taken from their eyes spiritually so they will see the Messiah they'll fall in love with him and there'll be a great revival there because they'll be raised up it's talking about those that are devout those that are sincere those that love God. There are many people, Jewish people who love God, but their, their eyes are closed to the fact that their Messiah was Jesus Christ. They're still looking for another to come. They will see the truth in that day. Verse 37, I will cause you to pass under the rod. That's judgment. God's word is the judge. But it's also the promises fulfilled, the promises to restore them, the promise to reveal himself face to face, the promise to save Israel. That's all going to be happening at this particular time, at that wilderness of the people. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. The covenant that they are, they will... Uh, 
be sanctified. They'll be glorifying God. They'll be walking in the spirit. They'll be walking in the Lord, glorifying God. That's the purpose of this whole thing. And then right at the end of this time, the return of Christ happens. He's coming as the king, the king of all the earth, the king of kings. I want to bring to you what it says in Amos about that. About five verses here. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. That's what we just read about today. But saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. That's very important to understand. All the sinners of my people, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. This, this is very important for us to understand. It is just as true today as it was when he said it, and it will always be true. The sinners will die. We're saying, no, that's not going to happen to us. Whatever the case may be, If we go on, we're going to see greater things. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. There again, here's the, here's the kingdom message right here. I'll close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. Then, or the, excuse me, that, they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. This is, this is just like we read in Psalms 2. He's raising up this kingdom. He's setting up his son as king of the earth on the throne of David, fulfilling the promise that David would never uh, have a time when he would not have someone on the throne. He had to stop the kingdom of the Israels, but he didn't stop the kingdom of the throne. Christ is destined for that throne. Verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. That's the Gentile. That's actually like Esau's crowd. And of all the heathen, when the Lord said in Psalm 2, I will give you the heathen for a possession. Does that mean all of the Gentiles will be saved? It doesn't say that here. It said, which are called by my name. Those that call by our, the name of the Lord. Those that seek the Lord so they can be called by the name of the Lord. So they can be children of the living God. Saith the Lord that doeth this. It's the Lord that does this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, 
and the mountains shall drop down sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. It's definitely talking about the kingdom time. When things even on earth and in the atmosphere will be changed. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. In other words, they won't be in captive anymore. He's going to bring them back, set them free, bring them into their own land. And they shall build the waste places, cities, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God. That's talking about the kingdom period. Prophesied in the Old Testament. Kingdom period is yet to be. People are talking about bringing in the kingdom. The Lord will bring in the kingdom. We are to walk in this life pleasing to God so that we can enter into that kingdom. And we're given us the marvelous privilege to do that. The heathen aren't given that, but those who turn to the Lord, those that seek the Lord, those that seek the Lord and understand the message that he wants people like him. He wants his kids to be like him. He wants them to walk like him. He tells them to. Walk before me and be perfect. He told that to Abraham. He's saying that to you and to me today. And I will bring you under the covenant, the bond of the covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. Now look at verse 38. Right at that time, the return of Christ as king of kings. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter the land of Israel. That's showing that it is a type. The land of Israel, the land that is there today is simply a type of the kingdom. The kingdom is not only a land, it's a time. It's a time, a thousand year time given in the word of God where Christ shall rule. The kingdoms of this world will be kingdoms of Christ. He will be the ruler of the world. It won't be any more antichrist. The devil will not be allowed to operate and Christ will rule in that thousand years time. The devil is thrown into the lake of fire by Christ at the end of the kingdom period. Verse 39, as for you, now this is very, very very important. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye serve everyone his idols, and hereafter also keep going on. And if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. If you want to keep on doing that, you're not going to pollute me anymore with your gifts and with your idols because you're not even going to enter in to my kingdom. This is all at the return of Christ. It's going to be a quite a purifying process here because the Lord is going to come with, with the rod of God, with the sword of the Lord coming out of his mouth, 
and he's going to destroy the wicked at the Battle of Armageddon. All of those that fight against God, all those that refuse the Lord, that hate God, hate his people, hate his word, they'll be destroyed. He's saying, if you want to go that way, go ahead, but you're not going to pollute my holy name anymore. And then comes that kingdom period, the millennial reign of Christ. I'll read just a couple here because I'm going to close soon. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. So come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. That's not only talking about the topography, which will happen because there'll be a tremendous shifting of the earth as Christ comes back and stands on the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives splits and he's got one part under one foot and one another part under another foot. And the, the whole thing has changed, but Jerusalem will be lifted up. But what it's also speaking about most importantly is that the kingdom is raised up and the word of the Lord will flow from Jerusalem Throughout the kingdom, it will flow from Jerusalem. Many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Speaking of the kingdom period, praise God. Uh, I'm going to read it in Ezekiel. A couple of verses here. 22 to 24. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them to, to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, no more Israel and Judah, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. There again, speaking of Christ, who is the root and offspring of David. The seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ, says in Galatians 3. And they all shall have one shepherd, all of Israel, one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments, observe my statutes, and do them. This is what the Lord is saying right there. That's how he will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And the whole world will see that and know that. Praise the Lord. You should read Isaiah 11, the whole chapter, because that shows how the branch, Jesus Christ, is coming, the king, and he will how he will uh, judge, and, and the, the uh, description of how it will be during the kingdom time. And here, quickly looking in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, 
that shows, behold, he cometh with clouds. This is Christ. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This is showing that everybody is going to see it when Christ comes back. And many people will be so filled with remorse and lament, lament because they didn't accept the Lord or they were fought against the Lord. The result, of course, is going to be a tremendous revival. And those of those who yield to the Lord. And out of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9, and it will come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. That's the, the tribulation period. And here is the kingdom. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they, uh, Excuse me, this is showing how he, he um, opens the eyes of the Jewish people during the tribulation period. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. That's the lamenting, the remorse, the, the repentance that will come from that. The goodness of the Lord is going to bring them repentance. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Uh, what a serious time that is. It, it will uh, be when that shall happen. It's also told in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31 through 33. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant, that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break. They broke my covenant. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, meaning in those last days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's exactly the same message that the Lord is giving to us today. He will do that as we follow him. Today he will do that. Praise his name. Let me quickly finish here. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, speaking to the people of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have been defiled. You shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evils you have committed. That's what we just read in these other verses. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have wrought with you for my name's sake. Not according to your wicked ways. Nor according to your corrupt doings. But why? For his name's sake. Because if he did it according to our wicked ways. And according to our corrupt doings, we wouldn't be here at all today. But this is speaking about the Israelites in their day. If he did it according to their wicked ways, if he levied the judgment because of only of that, and according to their corrupt doings, 
There couldn't be any left. Righteous indignation would have wiped them out. But for his name's sake, he wrought mercy and brought them into the time when they would be delivered. O house, O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord. Closing statements here. Uh, is showing the end time judgment of the nations, not about Israel, but the nations and judge because of the way they treated Israel. I'm going to take you to Obadiah verses 17 to 21. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. That's 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 the kingdom there in Jerusalem. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken it. This is not, this is not a judgment of complete annihilation. He's talking about the house of Esau. Those that rebel against the Lord. Those that don't care about their inheritance in the Lord. They'll be destroyed. They'll be like stubble. It doesn't say that none of them can be saved. It's giving an example of what's going to happen in that time. It'll devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. Those that live in that house of Esau, meaning the rebellion against God. That's just the way it's going to be. Amen. Glory be to God. That's true justice. Uh, I didn't finish there. And they of the south shall possess the Mount of Esau. And they of the plain, the Philistines. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is Seraphim, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's speaking of the kingdom of Christ and those that, that uh, have become his bride and then his wife that come back with him in the kingdom time will be uh, uh, used by the Lord in the kingdom to levy justice according to the word of the living God, the rod of iron. Praise the Lord. And so, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against the south, drop thy word against the south, and prophesy against the forest of the south field. Say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. As speaking of that prophecy there of the judgment of those nations as was told there in Obadiah. And all flesh shall see that the Lord have kindled it. 
It shall not be quenched. Everybody's going to know this is the Lord. Then, uh, then said I, this is Ezekiel saying, then said I, ah, oh, Lord God, they say of me, doth he not speak parables? How pathetic that is. He's saying that they're saying to Ezekiel, he's speaking in parables. We don't know what he's saying. They still don't get the message. That's why we have to go and look at this whole thing uh, next Sunday and speak about what Lord, the Lord is actually doing even in this day and age that we're living in here. The scope of the whole message is that ye shall know that I am the Lord. It prophesies of the captivities of not only Babylon, but at the uh, time when they were scattered all over the world because of the rejection of Christ as their Messiah and his crucifixion. But all of these judgments were in this section right here from chapter 4 to chapter 24. We're in chapter 20 today. They're dramatic and objective signs of judgment. On verse 20, I mean, chapter 25 to verse uh, chapter 29, it'll be talking about judgment of the Gentile nations. These are all judgment warnings. They still are today. Warning of the judgment is part of the gospel message both to Israel and to the world, the Gentiles. The purpose of it all, judgment, the purpose of judgment is to bring the obedient into full sanctification, the remnant, to have them come in established in a walk of, of holy faith, and to judge the disobedience and the rebellious. That's the purpose of the whole thing. These are all the divisions in the, in the book. But you look at the spiritual condition down here. And you see that Israel is a rebellious nation. Impotent children. Stiff hearted. These are the way that the Lord described Israel. But the spiritual condition of the remnant, whom Ezekiel is a type, committed and separated unto God. Separated unto God. Separated from the world, but unto God. These people are divinely chosen and equipped. And the whole message here is to the church today, showing that Christ must be lived. And as Christ is lived through the word of God, then he equips us and sends us forth to speak the same message to the world. Our destiny would be the rapture and the second advent, the millennial kingdom and into eternity. That's the message for you who have made it a point to make the word of God your life. It is your life. Without that, you do not have life ahead of you. Praise God for the true message. Remember the purpose of all these messages that God wants to bring to us 
is that we'll be comforted, that we'll be established in the grace, that we'll be, that we'll be rooted and grounded in him. And then we come unto all of these things are riches and the full assurance of understanding and acknowledgement of the tremendous mystery of God in our lives and of the Father and of Christ. And that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Only in Christ. Oh, praise God for this message. I pray that it'll be a blessing to you in all the days to come. That this will grip your heart in such a way that you'll see it as a tremendous opportunity to you that it is for you to be fully assured of where you're going and it is with God and Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever into a life of indescribable, indescribable peace and harmony that the world cannot give us. Praise God for his word. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we prayed at the beginning, let this word find good ground and grow and produce fruit unto eternal life for all that hear it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.